I wanted to take your picture. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming out tonight. For those of you at home, this program is being recorded and will be available on the York County History Center YouTube channel. If you have any comments or questions, please type them in the chat or comments on Facebook. Just a couple announcements about upcoming programs before our speaker. Our Civil War Roundtable program for this for July, uh, July 20th, the speaker is Dominish Miller, and she's speaking on the 87th PA Regiment uh, historically and the reenacting regiment today. On, on August 22nd, we have our Zoom book club, and I wanted to announce this because the book is Jacob L. Devers, A General's Life. I uh, did put some brochures on the table next to the All Vets things. The author will be joining the Zoom book club that night, so we hope you can join us for that. It's All of our programs are free and open to the public. And now I'd like to introduce Jeff Hawks, Director of Education and the Veterans Outreach Program in Carlisle. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Um, some of you know me, some of you don't. Uh, I'm the, uh, as mentioned, the Director of Education and Veterans Outreach for the Army Heritage Center Foundation in Carlisle. Uh, I am also a veteran of the United States Army. I served from 1988 to 1992, and uh, that's just a little bit up there about my, uh, my service. And uh, you can see that I was a veteran of uh, the, the 2nd Infantry Division the 9th Infantry Division. I served during Operation Desert Storm. I reached the rank of corporal uh, and was in the infantry before I got out and uh, went, went on to college and, and to do bigger and better things, I suppose. Um, however, you know, it. Uh, uh, here I am again working with the Army. Uh, the Army Heritage Center Foundation is the nonprofit friends group. I think, let's see if my, oh, this is, my clicker is not working. Um, because I didn't put the, take care of this. Yeah. There we go. All right. So uh, I work for the Army Heritage Center Foundation. We're a 501c3 nonprofit. We are the friends group for the U.S. Army Heritage and Education Center which is part of the Army War College up at Carlisle Barracks. Just to give you an idea of the, uh, the difference between the two organizations, I'm not a federal employee. I'm, I work for a private organization. Uh, most of the people who work at USAHEC are federal employees. Uh, and USAHEC is basically uh, the Army's archives. It's uh, an unofficial record center. The, the official records of the Army are kept uh, at the National Personnel Record Center in St. Louis. The other records are kept by the, uh, the National Archives in College Park, Maryland. Uh, what we have at USAHEC is a tremendous collection of photographs, documents, and artifacts that have been collected and donated by soldiers over the years. So we have about 15 million uh, of, of those photographs, documents, artifacts. Uh, we have a, a, a 350,000 volume library. Uh, and just it's a tremendous resource for soldiers, their families, researchers, anybody who wants to learn more about Army history. And one of the things I think is really neat for veterans, uh, besides the things you can see here, of course, you can see the facility here. You can see some of the, uh, the areas on the Army Heritage Trail. It's a mile long outdoor trail with a, uh, a macro exhibit. So you can see here we have a, in the Cold War area, era, we've got a, an M60 tank. That's the tail boom of a Cobra helicopter. Uh, back there. This is a Vietnam fire base, and uh, I think you could just see a little bit of the Huey helicopter back there as well. Uh, and so it, the museum portion is just a fantastic resources for soldiers and veterans to come, uh, and, and part of our design philosophy for the exhibits there is that every veteran should come and find some touchstone for their own service. So if you come and you look through the exhibit, uh, the chances are extremely high, it's by design, that you will see something that takes you back to your own days of service, whether it's a place, whether it's a person, whether it's an event, a piece of equipment, uh, or whatnot. It's also a great place to bring kids. 
uh, particularly on a, a summer day, you can walk them around the trail, but come home tired, uh, but also take them inside. They can cool off in the air conditioning uh, and enjoy the, uh, the exhibits there. Uh, the foundation, just to give you a little idea of what I do for the foundation, uh, we have the Veterans Cafe program where we do veterans breakfast. And uh, Rich, I think you're in that photograph there somewhere. Um, so we, we do regular breakfasts where uh, we have a speaker talking. Often, usually it's a veteran sharing their stories, but other times we'll have somebody from the VA or another organization with something of interest to, uh, to veterans. Uh, we have the Veterans Oral History Program, and we are recruiting for uh, that for next fall. And uh, that's an opportunity for uh, veterans to sit down with high school students and get their stories recorded. Uh, it's a really neat opportunity when we're done. We make sure the veteran gets a copy of it uh, that they can share with their friends and family. Uh, it's also a really neat opportunity because as more and more people know, uh, fewer and fewer people serve in the military these days. And most of these kids have no military uh, background or experience whatsoever. So it's a really great opportunity for them to meet a veteran and to learn something about uh, about the about the, the military. And then I have a summer camp, which um, I encourage you to, if you have kids in seventh through 10th grade, reach out to me. I've got some flyers here uh, and the folks here at the center can get in touch with me. Uh, if you have kids who are interested, might be interested in that. So, um, but one of the things that I don't mention here, and I think this is really important for veterans is, uh, the amount of unit histories that we have and the resources that we have that you can reconstruct your own story if you if you didn't take any photographs if you've lost your photographs the chances are that we have something from your unit or somebody close to your unit or your area of operations during your service uh, and one of my favorite unit histories we have thousands of them and one of the, my favorite ones that that really sort of sums up the um the, the gist of these and the benefit of these is uh, one called a scrapbook for soldiers too busy to keep their own. And this was put together by the unit commanders who uh, during a tour in Vietnam, who assembled these scrapbooks every year and then made them available to their soldiers. So uh, these are really fantastic resources for veterans or families who uh, want to come and, and learn more about maybe what their loved ones did that they, they never heard about. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about why we do what we do, or what's important about what we do. And I want to tell you the story of Bugler Howard Munder from um, a veteran, a soldier who served during the, the First World War. Uh, on June 27th, 1917, he was one of the 4.7 million American men and women uh, who enlisted in the armed forces during World War I. He enlisted with G Company, 1st Infantry, the Pennsylvania National Guard. He was a prolific letter writer. He wrote several letters a week, often multiple letters a day. Uh, and his, his family collected the letters uh, and, and we have them, uh, they were transcribed after the war and we have them in a bound volume in our collection. His letters describe his training at Camp Hancock, Georgia, and his deployment to France as part of the 109th Infantry Regiment of Pennsylvania's famed 28th Infantry Division. On September 21st, 1918, Munder's parents received a letter from their son in France that had been dated August 31st, 1918. That was the last letter that they received from him. Of course, this was worrisome to them because they were used to getting regular letters from him. And soon, because the unit was made up of also many men from Philadelphia, soon they began to hear from friends and neighbors unofficial news that Howard had been wounded in action uh, and was recuperating in a hospital. By November, they received official word. Uh, he'd been wounded on September 16th, but his status and location were unknown. At that, point, at that point, his parents began a lengthy letter writing campaign trying to get news of their boy. They received contradictory information through both official and unofficial short channels. They heard that he was in a hospital in Paris. They heard that he'd been evacuated to England, that he was back in the States receiving treatment, that he'd been discharged and was serving at Fort Dix. Eventually, they received the official word. Howard was listed as wounded and missing in action. 
Eventually, they were told he was presumed dead, but they did not give up hope. As late as May 31st, 1919, almost nine months after they received the last letter, they received a notification from the Adjutant General's office that Howard had been returned to the United States. Finally, on July 9th, 1919, 10 months after his last letter, they received a telegram concerned, confirming their worst fears. Howard was now listed as killed in action. But they didn't give up hope. And because we have these letters, we know the actual words as they tried to ascertain the state of the status of their boy. Mr. Munder wrote, while the foregoing is indeed saddening and disheartening, we have hoped so long that we still feel that the reply is not conclusive enough and that our boy may still be alive and may yet return to us. But it was not to be. The Army confirmed that Howard was dead and provided the location of his grave. In the final account, Howard had been advancing on September 6th with his company when he was wounded by machine gun fire. His fellow soldiers bound his wounds and left him for the medics, convinced his wounds were not severe, confident that he would survive. And this is what gave credence to the reports that he had. On July 26, Charles Munder wrote the adjutant and general's office in Washington saying, I am in receipt of your letter of the 23rd July containing the information in regard to the finding of the burial place of my son, Eugler Howard Munder. Company G, 109th Infantry, as contained in reply to my letter of inquiry sent to the Graves Registration Services. The final outcome of our long suspense is indeed a sad disappointment as the many conflicting reports we have had led us to hope for his ultimate return. We, however, bow to the inevitable, knowing our brave boy died happy in the discharge of his duty. Well done. If it wasn't for the people who gathered Howard's letters together and transcribed them, they were compiled and preserved by William Bell Clark from Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania, who served as the Secretary of Pennsylvania War History Commission from 1919 to 1921. And that is the importance of what we do at USAC, here in York, preserving these stories, because Howard's story would be lost to history. Nobody would know this story if we didn't keep these records. The dead especially cannot speak, save through their letters, diaries, journals, and other records they leave behind. That is their legacy, and that is the legacy that we guard, preserve, and honor the U.S. Army Heritage and Education Center through our museum exhibits, our public programs, and archival holdings. So what I'm going to do this evening is I'm going to take you through and introduce you to some of the soldiers in our collection uh, and then if we have time at the end, I will show you where you can um, where you can can go online and find more materials about them. But uh, many of these stories, these stories, they're soldiers, they, they live on our, our website. Uh, some of these stories were created using records in the collection. Some of them were created um, after I conducted oral histories with the with the veterans involved. So let's take a look. This is, uh, is, a, is a soldier that I love to tell his story with students because one of the things that this story illustrates is that we tend to think of people in the past as being rather stupid. They didn't know things, things that are obvious to us. And gee, why didn't everybody know that? Well, this is a great story because it's a story of a, a, a soldier who was very well educated and very intelligent. Charles Perkins was a valedictorian and, and an engineer. After high school, uh, he went to work for an engineering firm that built the Cog Railroad on Mount Washington in New Hampshire. Uh, but like many, when the call to duty came, he enlisted with K Company, 1st Massachusetts Infantry Regiment, and served from 1861 to 1864. Uh, he kept a pretty much a daily diary, which made compiling his story really easy to do because uh, all I had to do was look up the history of the uh, K Company and uh, match it with the dates of where he was, when he was, and I could go and find those diary entries really easily. 
But I want to share with, some, with you some of the things he, he wrote as he served in the Peninsula Campaign at Bull Run, at Manassas, at Fredericksburg, Chancellorville, and Gettysburg. Um, so, as I said, I like to tell soldier stories in their own words whenever possible. So think about this. Um, on Thursday, August 28th, during the battle of, uh, around the time of the Battle of Manassas, he wrote, up at sunrise, cloudy and a little rain. We marched about seven or eight miles today. I think along the stream Bull Run, as there is a bridge near us. Had a shower in the evening wet off, that wet us all through. But the sun soon came out and dried us all but our feet. Walking was some better. Water to drink is rather scarce. I tried to suck some from a tube from a puddle alongside of a road, but could not. It was too thick with dirt. Feel pretty tired when we came to camp. Now, this is where I always stop with the students and I say, I want you to think about this situation because that's your first clue as to what's going on. He's trying to drink out of a puddle on a road over which the entire Union Army has marched in the last 28 to 48 hours. I don't know what was in that puddle, but I can imagine that a lot of it wasn't water. Uh, that probably would have involved 30, 40, 50,000 horses and mules uh, going through that area. On Friday, August 29th, he wrote, up at about one or two, did not feel well, only ate a cracker and some water for breakfast. On Sunday, August 31st, he wrote, up at daylight, wagons and artillery, infantry still passing. I packed up, started on, met some men of Hooker's jerseys. He's looking for his unit. He's straggling behind. And they said they had stopped near the bridge in the night. When he got back, they were gone probably went to Centerville. So I kept on. I came across a chunk of meat, fresh beef. As the army moved, wagons broke down. They found an overturned cart. He found some supplies and helped himself to a piece of meat that he found. Now, what he would have done with that is he probably would have taken it and put it in his haversack, which was the bag that the Civil War soldiers carried their food in. Uh, they maybe washed that bag out once or twice a year, but usually all they did was turn it inside out and shake the crumbs out of it. So he's putting raw meat into this bag that he carries on his head. Came across a chunk of meat, fresh beef, and cut off a lot of it and put it in my haversack. This morning he had some beef steak for breakfast with crackers and coffee. So he found it the night before, kept it overnight, and cooked it for breakfast. I met one of, some, of General's aides, and he told me the church by the sawmill. This was about 10 o'clock. Went direct and found the regiment in rebel barracks. Company K in a nice room, good roof, and chimney. Big fire going, all present except me and Whit. He slept last night this side of the same creek where I did on the other side. Got some more crackers and raw salt pork. Ate some cracker dipped in coffee, raw pork for dinner. Fine rain all day. Stayed up until about four o'clock. War three quarters of a mile off. Reported to doctor as not able to keep up. Now he was using a shorthand in his uh, in his diary, which is why some of this doesn't make doesn't doesn't necessarily flow all that well. So again, here we go. He's back to the doctor because he's not feeling well. After we only marched about a hundred rods, fussed around short time, then formed up for camp for night. Whit and I pitched tent. I cooked, cooked a dipper of coffee crackers and raw pork for supper with flapjacks from Burdett, two fried crackers from Whit. Turned in after supper, had a big fire by our tent. The lieutenant stops with us tonight. I put my rubber blanket on the ground and Whit had his woolen over us. The lieutenant's tent, Whit's rubber. I was sick today. Went to the doctor. Looks like rain tonight. Pain in bowels today. Diarrhea again owing to drinking coffee, I suppose. And that's where I usually get a smile from the audience or from the students. Now, and then I ask the students, why do you think he has diarrhea? And they all immediately say, he's drinking out of puddles and he's eating raw meat. And I say, would you do that? And they say, no, of course not, why not? Well, they know that's going to make you sick. Now, why didn't Perkins know it? He's an educated man. 
very, very well educated. He works as an engineer because at that time in the Civil War, to them, sanitary, sanitary meant clear, clean of visible dirt. The steak, as long as it didn't look or smell bad, was considered to be safe to eat. But what does he blame his diarrhea on? Drinking the coffee, which was probably the only sanitary thing he's had for days because he boiled the water to make it. So this offers a fascinating glimpse into a world before the germ theory of disease. And you start to understand why two thirds of the soldiers who died in the Civil War died of disease, not as the result of, of enemy action. And it reminds us that people are not stupid. They're simply operating with the best information they have at the time. It's a good reminder to us not to be as too arrogant about what we think we know is the good and right and proper thing to do. Zipping forward a little, a little bit, I have to say, I have a soft spot in my heart for army nurses. Uh, when I was in Desert Storm, I was injured, not as a result of enemy action. I did something stupid. I was working under a five ton truck and I left the door open. And because I was not a truck driver, I didn't have the instincts and I didn't know that that was a really stupid thing to do. Because when I crawled up and stood up underneath the door, well, the edge of the door is about this high, about six inches lower than my head. And when the two made contact, it left quite a gash in my scalp. So I ended up going over to the, to the, the nearby, there was a, a hospital nearby and got some great care from army nurses. And I have to say, and I, I, I think that any soldier, um, sailor, marine, airman who was injured overseas, injured or sick, uh, particularly in time of war, maybe as a result of, of enemy action, to tell you there is nothing like the fear and the discomfort you feel when you're injured and alone and far from home and the comfort that comes from having a sympathetic hand tending to you uh, and taking care of your ailments. Lieutenant retired Phyllis Kogan, Army Nurse Corps, served in the 27th U.S. Army Mobile Surgical Hospital, Chu Lai in Vietnam from April 1969 to April 1970. Uh, Phyllis is local to the Carlisle area, and I had the great fortune uh, to conduct an oral history interview of her. Uh, tremendous lady, still does tremendous things for uh, the, the community, uh, and just an all-around gracious person. And she talked about why she became an Army nurse, and it's fascinating when you start to talk to soldiers, and you always start with that question, why did you join the Army? And the answers you get are just just they show the tremendous variety of, of, of the reasons why people, people served. And so Phyllis, again, in her own words, they had something called the Army Student Nurse Program through which you could have your last year or two paid for. You would list in the Women's Army Corps at the time. You enlisted as a private first class. You got an ID card and you could use the PX and it sounded like a great deal. I think I went to that PX the whole time, twice the whole time because it wasn't really convenient. As you know, as any veteran can tell you, what the recruiter tells you doesn't always turn out to be quite the truth. Uh, but it was nice to have. But what was really was important was that you got a stipend. It was under $100, but it seemed like a fortune. Six months before I graduated, I was honorably discharged from the Women's Army Corps. And the next day, I was commissioned as a second lieutenant in the Army Nurse Corps. And they paid for my last year of school. It was wonderful. Now, Phyllis, she had other reasons for joining uh, the military, too. It wasn't just to, to pay for training. She also mentioned that my father had been a Marine in World War II. This was a man who could not see the American flag without breaking into tears. He didn't think America could do no wrong, but he had great pride in what he had done. My mother was a little concerned that military, military nurses could get the wrong kind of reputation. My father replied, well, if they know her, they'll know better. And if they don't know her, what do you care? I always knew that my father was proud of my service. Just as an aside, this is something we see more and more of as you interview veterans and get to know them is that service runs in families. Uh, more often than not, when you talk to a veteran, why did you serve? Well, grandpa served in the Great War. Or Dad served in World War II or Korea. Um, and 
again, this is why telling these stories and getting them out to the public is so important because uh, 75 years ago, something like 75% of Americans had a direct connection to the military. They'd either served themselves or had an immediate family member who had served. Now that number is down under 15%. So she talked about getting to Vietnam and getting that, that wonderful thing that all veterans know about, uh, on-the-job training. That's when you find out that what they teach you in, in basic training is not necessarily how things are, are always done in the field. So she said, when I got there, they said, have you ever started an IV? And I said, yeah, I'd been on a ward at Fort Bragg and I'd learned how to do IVs with an 18-gauge needle. So they said, oh, good, we'll put you in the, in the ER. I said I didn't have any ER experience. I'm just out of school and my school didn't have an ER. I got down there and discovered that the IV they wanted me to use was even bigger. I said, I couldn't get that in a cat. And they said, before long, you'll be getting it in children, which turned out to be true. Now, of course, working in the medical field, she did see some of the horrors of war. And she said, we lost some patients. They came in with severe injuries that we couldn't treat. One of those memories I would almost like to forget and can't was a young man still alert saying, please, please don't let me die. He was bleeding out right in front of us and we couldn't stop it. That is one of those memories that sticks and doesn't want to go away. One day they brought some body bags in and the sergeants wouldn't let me go back to deal with them. An officer had to go back, but they would not let us go back. They said, these bodies have been in the water for several days and you don't need to see this. I don't think it was a lack of respect for our abilities, but a desire to protect us. When I asked Phyllis about security, because after all, she was in Vietnam and there was really very few places that were 100% secure, she replied, I didn't think about it. Whenever the alarms went off, we had to run down to the bunkers and sit there in the sucking heat until the bells cleared. The funny thing is, is that we were at the edge of a compound. Uh, and anybody who's been in the military will get the military, the, the irony of the military reasoning here. We were at the edge of the compound. And if the mortar landed 500 feet away, but off the compound, we didn't go to the bunkers. But if it landed three miles away, but on the compound, we went to the bu bunkers. We sat there one time on top of the bunkers watching the mortars hit off the compound. Uh, I asked her about her weapons training and she said, I had everything but the actual 45, which is what they were giving nurses at the time. Uh, that's another story because in basic, they had us fire the 45. Of course, the 45 had a pretty good kickback. So I fire it and the sergeant says, okay, you're done. And I said, wait a minute, I didn't hit anything. What is this for? He said, familiarization. So you know what it is. And I said, yeah, but that won't do me any good. And he said, Lieutenant, if the enemy gets close enough for you to fire that thing, throw it at them. Um, so Phyllis stayed in the army and served until retiring as a Lieutenant Colonel. She married uh, another officer who uh, was also who retired as a Colonel. I did ask, uh, and at one point she did outrank him and she said that was interesting. Um, so, but she retired in the late 1980s and reflecting on her time in Vietnam, she, she summed up simply by saying, I don't regret going. I would have gone again if we'd been there long enough. That's what I was, an army nurse. Dennis O'Connor is uh, a really interesting veteran that I, I really like to tell his story because I think it, it uh, breaks up a lot of the stereotypes uh, of uh, just, just what people think they know uh, about military service. Uh, Dennis was an aircraft repair parts specialist, a 76 Tango, with the 79th Transportation Company in Vietnam. He served there from December 1970 to December 1971. And I was fortunate enough to conduct an oral history interview with him about 10 years ago. So again, in his words, uh, that, that is a picture of Dennis. Um, and, and I'll get to this part here, which uh, a lot of folks will recognize as one of the more interesting uh, and memorable uh, military duties. 
So Dennis told me that he said, I was assigned to the 79th transportation company. I worked in operational readiness. We were responsible for keeping 365 aircraft flying up in the two core area. We were having trouble getting parts shipped up north. They put together a liaison team in Saigon and I went TDY to Saigon to work on this team at the Aviation Material Management Center under the 34th support group. I spent three months down there. So he said, my sole purpose there was to get high priority parts. We had a hard time getting rotor blades for UH-1s, the Hueys. We had to go to Long Bend to the open storage depot. There, there was a chief warrant officer four who was the equivalent to a brigadier general as far as his power went. He was in charge. I see some nodding heads. I think everybody's run into that guy. Uh, sometimes you swear your own company company supply sergeant thinks he's a four-star general the way he, he hoards uh, materials. It's usually something like toilet paper. Um, so we went through the open storage area and here were stacks and stacks of these rotor blades and we got the stock number. I mentioned to my driver, Sergeant Mack, that I noticed these rotor blades were back ordered and we couldn't get them. They were, ne the, they were necessary because we had hundreds of aircraft that needed these rotor blades. So I went into this warrant officer's office, a gruff old guy. I wish I could remember his name. And he told us we were full of crap. I got to use the word crack. Um, there weren't any rotor blades out there. He, 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 uh, his stock control computer didn't show any in stock. So I took him out to the storage yard and showed him where they were, where there were about a hundred of them. Anyway, we got them on the next flight out. He quit using the computers after that and went back to the card index. Now, to the uninitiated or the unaware, the significance of this story might not be clear. But to anybody who served in Vietnam, you know what the helicopter meant there. The helicopter was resupply. The helicopter was uh, air support. And the helicopter was medevac. And because of what Dennis and his team did that day, helicopters flew that wouldn't have flown otherwise. Now, I can't point and say Dennis saved that guy's life and that guy's life and that guy's life, but I'm confident that he saved lives that day. An aircraft repair parts specialist. He did it by being good at his job. And I tell you, when I heard Dennis's story, I never thought about supply and the service and combat service support and all the support troops the same way again. And I realized that the that the military really does fight, win or lose, as a team. And that everybody has to do their job and do it well for the team to survive. So he had some few uh, additional interesting stories to tell. Uh, he said, one time I got done with a 16 hour shift, it was midnight, I went to take a shower. The shower room had an old French latrine with a pull handle commodes and shower heads that came out and rained on you. There was a tile floor that was so slick that you had to be careful. I was there taking a shower and it was ice cold water. I took 365 cold showers. I don't take cold showers anymore. I swore when I left the country, I would never take a cold shower again. So just as I lifted my leg up to wash my foot, a round went off. They sent in three or four motor rounds that landed on our runway and blew some holes in it. It was just harassment, but we were close enough that the concussion knocked me on my butt. I, had to, I hightailed it out of the latrine to my hooch. By the time the third round went off, I was in my hooch. I got my steel pot, put my pants on, got my flak jacket, and was in the bunker. I hauled it down the company street, buck naked. I didn't care. I needed my steel pot and flak jacket. So, um, Let's see. Uh, okay, he also wrote, and this is this is this part here. This is everybody's favorite task. Uh, we had old wooden hooches that were infested with cockroaches. Other than that, though, we had good living conditions. We were four to a hooch. We had wall lockers and foot locker. The only bad thing about the hooch was it was close to the latrine, the mess hall, and the crematorium outside the post. 
When they fired up the, fired up the crematorium, the latrine and mess hall all at once, it was pretty bad. The latrine had a cesspool, but at Tuihoa and elsewhere, waste was disposed of by burning, and hence everybody's favorite, favorite chore. Yeah. Yes. Can you go back to Dennis? Sure. What? I'm assuming the guy on the left got his face burned, and that's why the guy on the right side. Yes. Yes. This is this is uh, uh, this is from a manual uh, showing the proper method. You you probably can't read it. It says proper method for igniting fuel in the burn out latrine. Uh, and this guy is just leaning over, dropping something, dropping a match or whatnot into it. And this guy is using the proper stick method. So, yeah. This guy should have been in my unit because we never got a shower <laughs> for a whole year. Yeah. We made the R&R. &R, the yeah. country R&R &R in the house, yeah. you know, Australia. Probably. Well, you know, everybody serves in, in different conditions. Oh, yeah. And one of the things I've learned now, you know, back in, in the Vietnam era when it was the draft, a lot of that was the luck of the draw. Uh, today in today's uh, army, it's all volunteer. And what I se seem to find is that is that people more or less sign up for what they think they can handle. And so some people will sign up for a position where they might go uh, a long time without a shower or hot food. And uh, other people sign up for something that's a little bit more comfortable or sometimes a lot more comfortable. Um, and I, I think that actually, my personal opinion is that's a benefit of the uh, of, of the all volunteer services that people are able to aim for that their comfort zone. And I think that enables them to be much better at their job. Well, nobody else gets a shower. You don't get one either. You don't feel like, you know, you're being punched. Right, right. Well, you sure don't want to be, you sure don't want to be those guys over there that don't get a shower when everybody else is getting one. So you never got cold water either, right? <laughs> Always warm water. But it was what it was. Uh, it was what it was. Absolutely. Uh, so moving forward a little bit, I don't know, are, are we mostly Vietnam veterans in the audience here today? So two Vietnam veterans, you, sir? No? Okay. Um, so this, this uh, Major Kevin Bourne uh, got his commission through the Reserve Officers Training Corps at the University of Nebraska and served in the Berlin Brigade from 85 to 89. Uh, he unfortunately was, in, in his estimation, was transferred out of the Berlin Brigade before the before the wall fell. So he didn't get to actually be there when it happened, but he was still in Germany uh, watching it fall. Um, this was a tremendous time. It, it overlaps with my period of service. Uh, if, if you recall, 1989 was just, just a tremendous year uh, for the United States, for NATO, for our allies watching what was going on in the Soviet Union and was soon to, to no longer be Soviet Union. Um, but the Berlin Brigade was was a remarkable example, was sort of a distillation of uh, everything Cold War in Europe. And so he has in his collection uh, a number of interesting artifacts. He's got photographs, uh, and here he is with it with an East German guard. And apparently, it's a place um, I didn't write down where it was. It's a it's a long German name that I couldn't possibly pronounce correctly without help. Uh, but apparently this was a place where it was very popular to go and get your photograph taken uh, with the guard who, of course, you know, like the guards in London, you know, was not able to move or, 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 or react in any way. Um, this is a, a fantastic, I love these artifacts. And, and uh, if you come to USAHEC, you can actually see the real thing. You can, you can go in the collection and take a look at it. But this is a, a travel flashcard. So one of the things that I learned from, from Kevin uh, from his collection is that the uh, U.S. Army routinely sent, they had three means of access to uh, West Berlin, by road, by rail, and by air. And so they would routinely send soldiers to travel those routes for no other reason than to prove to the Soviets that they could. This was a relic of the Berlin blockade. Uh, and so they just send people through. Uh, so the Soviets wouldn't think that, oh, maybe they're giving up on their right to, uh, to land travel or rail travel or whatever. And so there's a whole list of instructions, a whole packet of information that you would get driving your car from West Berlin over to West Germany. And this is one of the flashcards that you have, and it's in English, German, and uh, Russian. 
with the Cyrillic alphabet there. Uh, and you were supposed to show this if you were detained by the East German police or army. And it says, I request that a Soviet officer come to their location, come to this location. Now, the reason for this is twofold. One is it's to move the official process along. One of the other flashcards that says, I, I insist upon my right to proceed uh, without, in, without interruption uh, and so on. But what's really interesting about this is it's a dig at the East Germans. It, it not only facilitates the process, but you have to remember that the United States government did not recognize the government of East Berlin. As far as the United States government was concerned, the, the, the whole of Berlin was still being governed under the, the treaties that ended World War II. And those treaties had a process that we were supposed to move towards creating a German government and, and restoring their sovereignty and autonomy under that. But for a variety of reasons, a lot of Soviet intransigence, intransigence and attempts to control the process and deliver the outcome they wanted, it never happened. And so as far as the United States was concerned, uh, East Germany was not a country, it was an occupied zone and the Soviets were in charge. So if an East German police officer tried to, try, tried to, to, to give you orders or tell you what you to do, you were supposed to say, absolutely not. I'm going to deal with the Soviets. I'm going to deal with the people who are in charge because it's not you. Uh, and so that was that was an ironclad rule. And when you talk to soldiers who served in the Berlin Brigade, there were often these kind of wrestling matches, uh, these these sort of verbal wrestling matches with with East German authorities and Soviet authorities, just trying to to take advantage or to find a place where maybe they could pressure you into allowing them to do something that they weren't supposed to be doing. Uh, the other thing, and I think anybody who served in the '80s, this is from March of '81. Um, this was specific to the United States Army Berlin. By the time I got into the Army, they were giving Saida cards out everywhere. And Saida is an acronym. Good Lord, the military loves acronyms, don't they? And, and if you're like me, you'll remember some of those acronyms till, till, till the day you die. You, know, you forget your, your anniversary, but you can remember what Saida stands for. Subversion and espionage directed against the United States Army. Uh, and the idea of Saida training was uh, there are Soviet agents out there and they were particularly active in Berlin and Germany, but there were some that were active in the United States and they were looking for soldiers that they could uh, wheedle information out of. And sometimes it would just be somebody next to you in a bar asking questions. Uh, when I was getting ready to deploy for uh, Desert Storm, I remember sitting in a bar and a guy there was asking me, what unit are you with? Where are you going? And you know, because I've had this training, uh, I, I gave him all kinds of vague answers uh, and finally told him, says, hey, you know, I'm really not supposed to be talking about this. Now, it might have been completely innocent. He claimed to have been in the military, or it could have been somebody trying to get information out of me. Uh, so particularly what the, what the uh, Soviet agents would look for is they would look for a soldier who's having problems. Maybe he had a substance abuse problem. Maybe the soldier was in debt. Maybe the soldier is having trouble with a girlfriend or with his wife, and they'd offer a solution to that problem, and then use it to 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 pressure the soldier. Oh, you're you're in debt. You need money. Well, I can get you money, but you know I'd really like to see the duty roster from your company, uh, or something like that. Uh, and so uh, this was all all uh, a, a and there was actually a phone number that you could call. Hey. I've had this contact with this individual. I think you should be aware of it and whatnot. How common is that? Um, well, you know, in uh, uh, the KGB was extremely active. I mean, they had uh, tens of thousands of agents. Uh, part of the reason the Soviet Union uh, ended up the way it did is, is the amount of time, energy, and money they were spending spying on themselves. Uh, so I, I, I couldn't say exactly how common it was. Um, I could pretty much guarantee, I, I would feel comfortable saying that on any given night, any local hangout where soldiers went, there was at least one or two Soviet agents there looking for information. And I'll just give you, as an aside, I went to the Soviet Union in 1987. And at the restaurant, at the, okay, it was the bar. Uh, at the bar at the hotel, 
the Hotel Leningrad, I was approached by two guys who claimed to be U.S. Marines. And they said, hey, we don't get to talk to Americans very often. We'd like to talk, you know, what do you think about what's going on back home with politics, Ronald Reagan, all of this stuff? You know, years later, I mean, these guys were good. They they didn't have no accents. They had they they spoke idiomatic English. They had all the slang. And it wasn't until years later when I realized U.S. Marines don't hang out at a bar talking about politics, drinking Coke. You know, they don't. Okay, you know, they claim to be embassy Marines. You know, they weren't. Um, so you know, here I am, a high school student, getting approached by but and they didn't target me. They happened upon me. So how common was it? I'd say it probably wasn't wasn't uncommon at all. Uh, cer certainly, it was it was enough that the army put time and energy into it. We actually had an afternoon of Saida training in the army, so um, they thought it was serious enough. But I'm just going to finish with uh, one of the things that Kevin Bourne uh, said, and I picked Kevin Bourne uh, because he represents the Cold War, because he represents our standoff with with the Russians, <coughs> and because. We seem to be uh, back in a Cold War with the Russians. And I think that looking back on how we dealt with them before will probably help us figure out how to deal with them now. But he talked about, uh, about, about the Berlin Brigade. And he said, on a day-to-day -day basis, it was like being stationed anywhere else in the army. However, being 110 miles inside communist East Germany, did drive home the significance of the freedoms that we take for granted at home. But the times that I really had a sense of the Cold War, where the hair raised up on the back of my neck was when I crossed into East Berlin and traveled through the corridor through East Germany to West Germany by car or the duty train. Coming face to face with the Cold War in that, in that way, realizing I'm alone in what is ostensibly enemy territory. I, am, it's, I don't have, uh, you know, I'm unarmed. I'm massively outnumbered. Uh, and if they want to get me, they're going to get me. Um, using the telephone was also an adventure. I remember those commercials on Armed Forces Network Berlin warning that Ivan may be listening in on the conversations. So, That's my program for this evening. Do you have any questions? Any questions from at home? And they're welcome to take a few minutes to see if any of them, if any of them arise. I encourage you to come visit us at USAHEC. Uh, I have a couple flyers here for the summer camp and for the Veterans Oral History Program. Uh, and I, I, uh, if you, if you listening to me tonight and you want to come up, get my email address. Linda can help you. Give me a buzz. I'll be more than happy to come out and uh, and give you the nickel tour, uh, assuming my schedule permits. So um, I thank you for your time. I thank you for your attention. And oh, yes, question. You were at the office of the uh, museum Heritage Museum, or yeah, my office. My office is right there, uh, not too far from the guard desk. So okay. if you stop by and, and and ask to see me, they'll point you. They'll come. They'll come and get me. I was. I visited the Heritage Museum, but it was in the winter and it was mm -hmm. slow and bitter day. Mm-hmm. 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 I like the part of the uh, the era. Far as you get. Yes. Yeah. You have the little um, the dog tags, right. so you can walk through the exhibit. And there's, I think, six stations where you can you can plug that in and see how your soldier, whatever topic they're covering at that point, tells you about the soldier and their experience right. by that. So, like, there's a transportation yeah. area and, and whatnot. The, uh, shooting range simulator. Yeah, the electronic shooting range. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So we have a, we have a, a a machine gun and a rifle yeah. and a rifle range. Yeah. I associated that because I was a rifle instructor in Paris Island. Oh, all right. Well, you and I should talk afterwards. I've got, I know somebody who's at Paris Island right now. Uh oh. So, but so that's why you were nodding your head when I said Marines don't uh, hang out in bars drinking sodas and talking about politics, right? Yeah. So. All right. Any other questions?
All right. Well, thank you very much.